All right, uh, so we've got our council study session. First up, we have Portland General Electric Smart Grid Test Bed Discussion. Uh, that'll be introduced by Peter Passarelli, our Public Works, Public Works Director, and Natalie Rogers, Climate Action and Sustainability Coordinator. And do we yeah. have guests? We do. All good, right. Good evening. Would you like to uh, I'm Peter Passarelli, the Public Works Director. And this evening, we've invited uh, PGE, our utility partner, uh, to come and give a presentation on, on the smart grid test bed that they're in, in the process of implementing in, into our community. As you recall, the smart grid uh, is one of the strategies that we identified in our climate action plan, one of the 53 strategies. And we've been working with PGE uh, on, this, on this project, this implementation, for probably about 18 months or so. Uh, tonight with us we have Jason uh, Klotz and, 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 and Timothy Treadwell from PGE. They're the, the, the resident experts at PGE on, on this project and it, we've been working hard with them. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to them to, to talk about the test bed. Great. Hello council members. My name is Jason Solomon Klotz. This is Timothy Treadwell. We're from PGE. We're managing this particular project on behalf of PGE and our city partners. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of a discussion, some back and forth. I'm assuming you have lots of questions. So um, let me give a little, we'll give you a little bit of background on what this project is all about. And interrupt us at any time if you have questions. Is that all right? OK, great. Um, there we go. OK, here's our, our agenda. We'll go over a little bit of the greenhouse gas goals and. The, how this particular project should help with greenhouse gas goals and the vision for the project and how it might help with the state's and the city's greenhouse gas goals. Um, we'll do a little bit of energy background so we can sort of level, uh, set everybody around how the grid works and, and what the difference is in a smart grid as opposed to the way the grid traditionally functions, what the challenges are that we're trying to meet. Then we'll go over um, the test bed project itself. So as, as you know, because I've seen this in some of your materials as well, these are Oregon's greenhouse gas goals under present activities. You can see the red dotted line. We're not likely to meet the state's greenhouse gas goals. Um, it's a little unfortunate that we were unable to pass a cap and trade bill, which would have assisted in helping to push that red line down towards the yellow line. In my prior job with the state. Um, I worked on greenhouse gas policy for both Oregon, California, and uh, for what's known as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. There's a series of what used to be nine, but now seven states working on a carbon cap and trade system out east. So um, Milwaukee's goals, as you know, you have a big reduction number coming up here real soon in 2020, about 15% reduction overall. Um, I'm hoping that with our partnership we can help you meet those goals in a couple of areas. Um, one of the areas is going to be with uh, building energy and energy efficiency. So through the test bed we'll be testing a series of uh, technologies and practices and engagements with customers to help them understand the benefits of lowering their overall energy bill. So not just their electricity bill, but their overall energy bill. So are they heating water with gas? They may be able to lower their overall water heating bill by switching to electric. If you are driving a uh, internal combustion engine, you can save quite a bit of money by switching to an electric vehicle. And over the years, I'm sure that we're going to see many, many more electric vehicle options on the road. I know that they're limited at present. Um, again, with the vehicles and fuels plans that you have, um, I was just at the um, your charging stations that PG has set up here uh, just before I came over here to charge up my own car. Um, and I think that it'll also help with some of your fleet aspirations as well. Are those charging stations getting used? Do you have any info on the how much use numbers? they? Yeah. I will get you utilization numbers. Okay. Is that all right? You, right? No one's 
they haven't given you information on that yet. Mm -hmm. I will give utilization numbers to Peter here, and you can pass them along to you. Okay, great. If, if I can add one other thing on, on that, we're, we're actually taking advantage of another grant program that PGE has um, out right now, the Drive, is it Drive? Change Fund. Drive Change Fund. Uh, and we're going to put in an application for a public charging station to put out at the Johnson Creek uh, campus. That's due August 30th. Yeah, there's a um, law that was passed a few years ago uh, called the Clean Fuels Fund that creates credits uh, for switching from high carbon fuels to low carbon fuels for transportation. Those credits, sort of like renewable energy credits or cap and trade credits, are fungible. There's a market for them and you can sell them. We receive those credits anytime somebody powers up at one of the, one of the electric stations that we own. Um, and then we use those credits to create new programs for the cities, communities. So um, I want to level set us a little bit about how the grid functions and what the challenges are. Um, I'm sorry this is so small. Um, but this thing here, this gray line, this is demand. And you can see it's pretty predictable. Um, it's actually more of a two-hump system in um, Oregon is a winter. In the winter, we have a morning peak and we have an evening peak. And then there's a sort of lag in the middle. But it's pretty predictable. <coughs> um, this is Bonneville's system. And the reason I put this up here is it's more illustrative. It's more helpful to see this system than it is ours, just because it's more simplified. Um, you see these two lines down here, these, this red line and pink line? Mm -hmm. This is your, what we call, all day, every day, or base load power. The stuff is always on. It's always providing electricity. But it doesn't move well. It's just there. And it serves the load that's always on the system. There's always a certain amount of demand on the system. And so these resources are always on serving that demand. Um, see this line right here, this blue line? You can see how it moves up and down. This is wind. So traditionally, the way the system worked was that we could use these baseload systems, this nuclear, biomass, uh, fossil fuel, to chase the load or the demand, to serve the demand. Demand went up, you ramped things up a little bit with your hydro system to make sure you could meet the peak, whether it was the morning or the evening. The way the system is going to have to work going forward, because we have wind on the system, wind operates when the fuel is there, and we don't control the fuel. With the rivers, we control the fuel to a great extent, but not all the time. With these systems, thermal systems, we control the fuel, so we control the output. But with wind, we don't control the fuel, so we don't control its output. And so what we have been doing for a very long time is using the dams and the rivers to help balance this wind, to fill in when the wind isn't operating, and to back down when the wind is operating. In the future, what we need to do with these things called smart grids is use the demand to help balance the wind and to bring on more of this stuff, more of this renewable energy, which is, we don't control its fuel, so we don't necessarily always control its output. So we have, to, we have to be working with the demand, the customers, to help balance the system. So that's what a smart grid does. It helps to balance the system. Before, we were just chasing the demand. And now the system has to balance on both sides, both the supply and the um, So that's the idea behind the smart grid. So, we have a portfolio of resources right now that we're going to be testing inside the test bed. What's DR? So DR. DR is something, it's, it's an industry term. It's called demand response. And I know that sounds terrible. We don't like to use it. It's like I demand and you respond, right? That's how it's supposed to work. No. <laughs> we really don't want that. In fact, um, Peter helped us when uh, we were initiating this project, at least thinking about this project initially, uh, coming up with a term about getting it, loving it, and forgetting.
forgetting about it. So what we would really like to do is for customers to be enabled by technologies and the technologies take care of the customer's comfort levels for them and make sure that the customer can help with the grid and to help bring on renewables and to help bring down the carbon content of the electricity that serves them and the electricity that's on the system without affecting how comfortable they are. One, one great program we have is a water heater program. So most of us, most of us get hot water out of our water heaters, right? That's what we buy a hot water heater for. But amazingly, a hot water heater can actually work like a battery to the grid. The grid doesn't know it any different, that it's not a battery, but we can, we can contact that water heater and we can have the water heater move up and down in a certain bandwidth of temperature, thereby using more or less electricity at certain times of the day. And we put, the water heaters now have enough smarts in them to know, based on certain expectations, when you use hot water and when you might need it. So it can provide services back to the grid, which we would pay the customer for. And then the water heater provides hot water to you. So an efficient hot water heater, like a heat pump water heater, is super efficient, costs about $150 a year to operate, which is significantly different than electric resistance or a gas water heater. It can provide you with hot water at a really low cost. It can provide the grid with benefits and services and then we can pay you on a seasonal basis for using your hot water heater. Our hot water heater customers, we call on those hot water heaters hourly and those customers don't, they don't know that that's what's happening. We've, we haven't gotten a complaint yet. And we have 3,900 units enrolled so far. Hmm. So that, I'm sorry, so that requires uh, uh, this new kind of water heater, this, what'd you call it, a heat pump? A heat pump water heater? Uh, yeah. Actually. It, or can you do it with any electric water heater? We can do heater. it with any electric okay. water heater, yes. Okay. It doesn't require a heat pump water heater. Um, you'd save a lot of money by switching to a heat pump water heater. Uh, Energy Trust has incentives. We hope to be able to provide incentives for heat pump water heaters in, the, in this program. But we can retrofit a, an electro resistant, electric resistance water heater. So this is a definition of demand response that we use. We, this is set by the Power Council. They're a regional organization that works with almost every utility in the four states. And the idea here was to have a very expansive view of what is demand response. So being able to work with your electric vehicle so if you're plugging your electric vehicle into your home, it, <clears throat> your electric vehicle is smart enough to know w at what percentage it needs to be at for you in the morning when you leave. Well, we can be working with that electric vehicle other hours of the day to help balance the grid. If there's an excess of wind, remember the wind moves whenever the fuel's, if there's an excess of wind on the system, we could be putting it into electric vehicles if there's not enough, then we can, we can lower the charge rate of those electric vehicles so we're not overtaxing the system. Um, if you have rooftop solar, a battery paired with rooftop solar is going to give both you and the grid a whole bunch of benefits. And you can sell services back to the grid. Um, so there's, there's a whole host of activities inside the concept of demand response, which is what we're trying to work with inside the test bed and get customers engaged with. We're not, when we, when we go out to our customers inside this project, we are not using the term demand response. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to communicate to them what the benefits are of engagement and participation in any of these programs. What are the benefits to the customer? And because this is a new resource for us, we're trying to find out what are the best ways to engage? How do customers like to participate? What are the technologies that are right for the different types of customers? And what are the benefits of each different type of customer? So 
So when I talked about the concept of demand response presently, we use it as a resource when the grid is stressed at high demand. We try to lower the amount of demand for a short period of time. That's all the way over here on the left of this slide. And remember when I was talking about the water heaters and how we can call those water heaters almost every hour? That's on the right over here. So there is, there's a certain amount of capability that we can get out of any type of resource up from the customer side. And the idea, again, is to, is to build a resource that the customer gets it, loves it, and forgets about it. We don't want to inconvenience the customer. We don't want to uh, put the customer in a position of being uncomfortable for some period of time. So I don't really understand how to read that. <laughs> that doesn't, I, yeah, I don't understand what those flags so, are. Um, energy efficiency. Uh, when you buy an efficient clothes washer, that savings is always there. We know it's there, but we can't see it. And we can't really talk to it. We can't really use it for the good. We can use it for planning purposes. It helps us determine how much demand is on the system. It lowers the overall demand. So if you know, 10,000 people get efficient clothes washers, it lowers the overall demand on our system, and we don't have to buy additional resources, which means we can keep rates lower. So that's all, what's all the way over on the left. All the way, what's over, all the way over on the right is um, there are certain types of assets, whether it's a water heater or a battery in a house or a battery at a industrial customer site or a battery at a commercial customer site or some of these uh, electric cars, those, those types of assets can actually communicate with the grid in every second of, that they're connected. And because they're connected every second, that means we're communicating with us and we can talk to them and ask them, do you have any services that you can give us? Can you lower your demand? Or can you take additional electricity if it's on the system? That's the idea, is we're moving from a system where we don't we know it's there, but we don't necessarily see it, to a system where we know it's there and we can talk to it and utilize it, just like we use a big generating plant. So some of the alarm companies have systems where you can have everything programmed and you, for your phone. You can turn lights on, you can turn your heat on before you get home and yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, is that something you could link into to do this kind of stuff? Yeah, that's the idea of the smart home. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So part of the concept of the smart grid is that we have a, a whole host of smart homes. And all those smart homes are working together, and they're working with the customer, and they're working with us. Because they have enough capability to work with all these parties and to fulfill the needs of each party. I don't want to be turning down your lights, though. I have no interest in that. <laughs> I really would like to be able to communicate with, if you have an electric car, and I'd like to be able to communicate with your water heater and um, your HVAC system, your heating and cooling system. Does it, any of you have a smart thermostat in the house? No. Not yet. Like a Nest thermostat? <laughs> I'm in the test bed, so okay. this is my bad. <laughs> you don't, okay. No, it's okay. You don't just mean programmable. What's a smart? So a smart thermostat is like a Wi-Fi enabled thermostat? Yeah. Oh. It's like the ones you've been, the PGE's been advertising if you have a heat pump That's right. um, system, you can get one for free and That's right. yeah. I don't know if I have a heat pump or whatever other kind, so. Yes, we've noticed that in, um, Rolling that program out, a lot of our customers don't know the difference between whether or not they have a heat pump or not because the, the box difference. looks very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, a heat pump will run in the winter. That's the big difference. Um, so yes, if you have a smart thermostat, we want to communicate with the thermostat. And what we end up doing is sometimes we'll pre-cool or preheat the house by a degree or two. At within your comfort level. And then we will, during the times of peak demand, have you 
either run a little bit, run the thermostat down or up, depending upon the season, so that you have less demand on the overall system mm -hmm. while maintaining your comfort levels. And then we, because you're enrolled in the program, you either get a free thermostat as part of that relationship, or you receive an ongoing seasonal incentive for bringing your thermostat to us, or like enrolling your thermostat in our program. Jason, can you maybe explain up the top of the, the chart there, the shape, shift, shed, and shimmy? I mean, that, yeah. that, might, that, might, be, help. that might help a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I know what they mean in other contexts, but I'm not sure what they mean with that. <laughs> so, so shaping is like that energy efficiency piece where you get these big giant chunks of savings, mm -hmm. and those big giant chunks help us plan, but they're not, they're not, we can't, again, we can't see it necessarily, we can't <coughs> communicate with it. It's like if you have a large systemic irregularity in your load, so you're in a warm climate, and there's a lot of air conditioning load, and that, that's a consistent peak, it's a consistent problem. If you did an energy efficiency program that was focused on increasing insulation in the home or improving the efficiency of the air conditioning unit, it would bring down that load in a consistent, predictable way. It would reshape your overall annual profile. So that's, that's the shaping of the, of the load. Whereas shifting is like, is during the day, so that would be, like, we don't want you to come home and plug in your EV and start charging at 5. We would prefer that you charge at midnight when there's less demand. So that's shifting load from a period of peak to a period of off-peak. The shed and shimmy, the shed is more when we have an, uh, an event that's unpredicted. Um, there's an intermittent renewable, clouds come over, solar generation, tanks, or the wind forecast isn't, isn't what we expected. We can call on resources like a large industrial customer and they can just shed the load, they can turn it off. That's a, that's a traditional demand response. And the shimmy is that, that fast acting, intermittent, sub one hour, where, like Jason was talking about the water heaters, where we're using a customer side resource in real time to do load matching to generation. So those are the, those are the four different concepts. And the, it's a stylized graph, but the, but the triangles are, kind of, it shows you the percent of technology where it says highest value on the left, and as you move from um, annual to seconds, uh, the, the, the total uh, number, the total amount of technology starts to tail off. So shaping is really great for loads like that you want to change for a year. But as you start to approach the day or the sub, sub 24 hour, it's, you're kind of getting into the next type of the technology. It, it, there's a lot happening there. It's kind of a confusing graph. So with with everything moving as quickly as it is and all the electronic opportunities or whatever, I'm not sure just even what to call them, but in fact thinking of one of the projects one of my grandkids is working on, where you can practically, like you talked about talking to your car and to, you, you're talking to a car and talking to our water heaters and stuff. I mean, there's... There's going to be a lot more things that you're going to be able to communicate with. And I mean, one of the products I know that's being worked on is a sensor in soap, laundry soap, that tells you how much they're using so that you can be reminded when to buy another box of it. <laughs> and I know. You will at some point be able to communicate with things like that, right? And be able to, or well, maybe not quite that one, but can you we don't imagine? Be that intrusive. <laughs> I mean, there are those kind of things that are happening. I, maybe Google and Amazon would be interested in that. But well, they are actually. But, yeah. We're yeah. more interested in the really, the really big the parts big of things. your usage, which is your water heater or your car. And, and the newer washer and dryers that are coming out? I mean, because you... There was, uh, years ago, there was a project where uh, there was a company, uh, actually the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory out in Washington had conducted a project where they were using dryers, clothes dryers. It's like, that's because that's a pretty big demand. And they were, they would turn off the heating element remotely, but leave the drum running. Oh, um, But we don't presently have anything that can do that right now. Yeah. That was a very advanced 
project from 2006. But someday you'll be able to talk to our washers and dryers. I bet you anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that um, yeah. some washers and dryers now call home when they're about to break and yeah. order a part. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But um, we're not we're not there. As a company, we're not there yet. Those, yeah. those to us uh, right now, those, those are um, maybe secondary or tertiary interests. Right now, we really want to move some of these bigger and talk to some of these bigger pieces of demand in the home, like your air conditioning demand or your electric car or getting your water heater. Yeah. So, would you? If, are, are you looking at, is there, like, I mean, I think about the people that wear, what are they, smart watches or whatever, where they can tell you almost anything, you know, communicate with those in any way and say, turn down your thermostat or don't use your <laughs> we, washer um, after I received eight a text from PGE to yes, that I'm very sure. Yeah, to that, really? Yeah, yeah see? So that's, yeah, all those kinds of, I mean, it's fascinating what's happening. So. Tim will probably tell you a, a little bit about those text messages. So um, we have been communicating with all of the customers in, so in the test bed, doing... both in Milwaukee and uh -huh. Hillsboro and Portland, about the Sunday thing. when the when there are times this summer and then coming this winter when the grid needs assistance, and we we give you a te we send you a text message the day before about. An event or an opportunity to save yeah, money, and one awesome. will pay you to save electricity during a certain period of time or hours the next day. And when you do that, um, we we can tell by your meter how much electricity you've saved, and then we pay you a dollar for every kilowatt hour that you've mm -hmm. saved. Oh. Unfortunately, if you're already doing passive cooling techniques, this is probably less beneficial to you. <laughs> um, Go me. If you're, yeah, if you're already being energy efficient, that's a good thing. Right. Um, you're ahead of the curve. But every, every little bit helps. That's the idea, is that um, every little bit helps from every, from every customer. And we can aggregate that assistance to help the system and to bring down costs for everybody. That's the idea. So electricity, at, when it's really hot out or really cold out and everybody's using it, believe it or not, um, electricity and those periods of time is actually really expensive. Oh, yeah. And so it, it just when anything's in high demand, it generally costs more. And so when we can lower the demand, we can lower the overall cost of the system. Those costs to serve the entire system are then passed along to the customer. And so by having everybody save just a little bit, we can help lower overall rates. We can also help to bring on new renewables, and we can help to lower carbon, because generally the resources that serve at that really high peak are going to be thermal resources, because we can control them. We can turn them on. By thermal, it's also fuel, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So, Tim, oh. do you want to yeah. yeah. test bed? Right? Yeah. yeah. So, cool. So Jason gave kind of the background on um, the the motivations, the kind of the policy landscape that the test bed is being deployed under, and I'm going to talk about the test bed itself. Um, these are just top level statistics. Um, two and a half year, six million dollar project. Um, it's at three substations: Hillsboro, Milwaukee, and North Portland, um, and it's a it's an applied field research study really trying to understand how to engage customers more effectively and being active participants in the grid. So um, we started with a baseline survey of residential and business customers in these three areas of, of the Portland metro area to understand the extent to which they, they grasp the concepts that Jason was talking about, um, you know, that we have to balance load and generation, that electricity costs more during certain periods of um, high demand and that electricity generally speaking at scale is not storable or dispatchable it's um, especially renewable resources uh, and through this project we're trying to engage customers have them understand those concepts become active participants in load management um, programs and ultimately move towards direct load control those uh, those type of smart appliances like thermostats and, and water heaters um, so that we can integrate more renewables. Just to give you an, an idea, um, we did a decarbonization study for our system. 
So what would it take to decarbonize our system and get us to that 100% all the time renewable system, right? So in that scenario, one quarter of our system's resources or 900 megawatts of electricity would have to come from our customers, from programs like this. In order to meet that zero carbon goal, we need to enroll almost all of our customers in some way, shape, or form into some type of program. Um, right now, we have about 6%. So getting to that sustainable level and a sustainable, what we call customer value proposition for that engagement and participation is what this project is all about. Does that 900 megawatts factor in uh, expectation that people will be, that, that customers will be shifting more of their usage to electricity from natural gas? Yes. Coming yeah. here. So, okay. Thank yes. You. Yeah, that's a key aspect of decarbonization for us. So is it, um, I see you've got 66% per participation. That's what you're trying, hoping to get in the... Yeah, in each we, area? we wanted to, um, and, and Peter was involved in these discussions, we wanted to... It's Peter's fault. <laughs> we wanted to get a critical mass of, of customers engaged in the program so that we could actually learn something. And if typical program participation is, you know, four or five percent, and there's a huge bias in that, self-selection bias, and those, they don't, those customers and their um, values and perceptions of value don't represent the diversity of customers that we would see in the service territory, and we want our lessons to be applicable to the entire customer base. So I'll get into it, we used an opt-out tariff, but we wanted to, to hit that really large threshold so that we knew what we were learning and seeing in the field was actually applicable um, yeah. broadly. Here I am, I'm talking about batteries and electric cars. Right, and, and new water heaters. That's only a small subset of our customers that can afford those things. If we're going to a decarbonized system, we need to reach many more different types of customers, including the low-income customers. Mm -hmm. Those customers that are struggling to pay their bills. We need to offer them answers through technology like this, through programs like this. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to meet those decarbonization goals. Everybody needs to be involved. And so if somebody didn't have, somebody had gas as their heating and had, didn't have an electric car, but yeah, they have, maybe they have an electric uh, water heater. Would you want that person in the program or would there not yes. be enough reason? Yeah, we would have them, It. well, let's get into it. So okay. we, we would definitely, I'm gonna skip through this, I think, because these questions are, I can get back to it, but the peak time rebate program is the is the default program offering, and this is um, this is current available to every customer with a few exclusions, uh, mostly around metering or or previous um, previous uh, desires on their part to be opted out of our marketing. So the peak time rebate program, um, and Jason explained this. We we benchmark your usage and we call an event. You can respond however you like. If so, that customer that you ex, that you were talking about, where they had gas heat um, and uh, electric water heater, if if I were that customer and I wanted to maximize my savings and my my rebate um, during that period, I would not use hot water during that period and probably slightly before that period because you're there's a lag in the heating, um, the resistance heating, uh, and they would save significantly relative to um, doing nothing relative to their baseline. So there's, that's a non, that's what we would call, to use our jargon, behavioral demand response. It's a, it's a non-technology solution. We're saying, letting you know that there's a, a need for resources, if you can provide resources in any way that you like, we, we will take those resources and pay, them for, pay you for them. And uh, you'll see more of our marketing as we go into September when we're gonna be out in the field with our campaigns, but we're saying, you know, go out to dinner, go to the park, get out of the house, just shut everything down, and you'll benefit, we'll pay you for that. And it's, a, it's kind of an easy and non-technical way to, um, to save. Tim, then, but they could also take advantage of the peak time rebate, even if they have a natural gas water heater, by perhaps changing when they're washing clothes. Absolutely. Right, so they're, they're, they're 
changing their behavior at home and taking it. Yeah, any any type of turning off lights, computers, anything that that you would normally be using during that period of time would establish your baseline. And so, if you're altering that behavior, then we'll see it in your in your metered um, reading, right. and you'll benefit from that. Yeah, because it's you're not measuring at the hot water heater or the refrigerator yep. or the washer and dryer. You're measuring at the meter, so yeah, it's right. really total use in the house. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's no downside to this. So if you don't participate, you just take service as if nothing happened. Your rates don't change. So it's only years, an opportunity. That's years it. ago in California, there was a program where they, I think they just encouraged us as users back when I lived there to not like use your washer and dryer in a in the shank of the day, you know, like from 10 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. or something, and you know, work on on doing that like really late at night when the demand mm -hmm. was less, and that that brought the energy usage down and therefore the price down for everyone. Yeah. So there's two. So I used to be a regulator in California. I'm familiar with these programs. So. You're either talking about what's known as a time of use rate, where there's a you pay a higher amount for every kilowatt you use during a certain time period of, of time. Yeah, I think that was it. And yeah, then it's been night, so many years. It's much I forgot, lower. But. So we've been looking into time of use rates, um, but we've decided uh, to do this peak time rebate mm -hmm. because there's no downside. Customers aren't punished right. if they don't participate. Whereas with a time of use rate. If we put everybody in the test bed on a time of use rate, some customers' bills would be higher. Yeah, exactly. We didn't well, want so that. this sounds a lot friendlier. Yeah, and, and we defaulted. Uh, the, so the commission gave us the authority to automatically enroll eligible customers in this program. So there's about 19,000 residential customers in the test bed between the three areas. And um, we went through all the eligibility screenings, and there were about 13,000 and change that we ended up converting. So we did that July 14th, I believe, 15th. Um, we did we converted them over. So if you guys live in the test bed, you probably got a mailer before that that said this was coming. Hopefully, you got an email after. Some of you got the wrong mailer. I apologize. I got the for wrong that. mailer, and I haven't gotten anything since. No. No emails. <laughs> nope. Nope, and data, I will tell you that your guy quality. who answered the phone was was not very knowledgeable either. You, oh, when you called customer, customer Yeah, care. when I called the number on it, because I got the business mailer, I got mm. the business, the mailer designed for oh, businesses. And I called him and I said, well, I'm residential. And, and then I said, well, so I have a gas heater, I have a gas furnace, I wouldn't be a candidate for this, right? And he goes, yeah, that's probably right. So does that not sound like the answer you're giving? So. No. And, and, <laughs> Yeah, please um, <laughs> provide that feedback. Part of this, and we're learning. We're trying new programs. We're we're definitely stressing PGE systems in, in all the ways: engineering, interpersonal, um, program design, and delivery. So that feedback's w more than welcome. Strongly encouraged. Um, yeah. 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 So two of us live in the mm -hmm. test yeah, bed. And the yeah. And Peter. Oh, and, oh yeah, Peter does. Yeah. So d during our recent Carefree Car Free Sunday that we had a week ago, week and a half ago, at Wichita Park, where I spent most of my time, there was a booth of PGE. And I thought, it, I'm pretty sure it was this that they were signing people up for. Would that be correct? Because it was, you know. Well, that wasn't the area. Using but things, you know, at peak time, or, you know, not using them at peak time. For using Oh, that was the. the was green, that something the different? Green tariff. The green area. Yeah. Well, there's Green Source, which is mm -hmm. the residential program. So they probably did have a booth. Green, it was green Mountain Energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for that one, there may have been, there has been advertising going on for the peak time rebate for everyone outside, even the test bed territory. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, and Green Mountain's doing some enrollments for that as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, I signed up. It sounded like a good deal. You know, it's like, why not? Try to help any way you can. But well, that's that's good. But, but, yeah, but but I, you know, when I first saw the information about this, I was thinking it was the same thing. But it sounds like it was something that was a little bit different. Yes. Yeah, so that. I don't know because I haven't received anything from PGE since I did that. So we um, the peak time rebate program uh, 
exists in exists both within the test bed and outside the test bed. Mm -hmm. Within the test bed, every all of the residential customers that were eligible, as Tim was saying, were signed up. Yeah. Um, they didn't have to do anything. For others outside of the test bed, it's voluntary. You have to sign up. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. Are you um, working with our NDAs for um, connecting with residents in Island Station? So they're the. I was going to say something about is September seventh is the Island Station Neighborhood Association picnic, and that would be a great place to do some outreach um, because everybody there is is in the test bed uh, oh, yeah. area. Have a table. Have a, yeah. Have a and they meet. all show up. Yeah. I mean, it's a very well attended yeah, picnic. Yeah, it is. Sometimes. I think right now we're doing. I the, like it. Well, you said the seventh. Yeah. First Friday. Yeah. yeah first Friday. This is. I'm sorry. You know, I'm repeating the Island Station Neighborhood uh, Association. I can. I can send a, a link to. That's that great. great. If I have an email contact, I can do that. Great. Yes. Thank you for that. But yeah. First Friday is great too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First Friday, you'll get more than you know. We'll, we'll just be. Tim will go over this, but we we are hiring someone uh, that will be embedded here in the offices and will be working. In, in your neighborhoods to better understand the customers and how the customers are receiving this project and the programs that are inside the, pro the project. And we're housing that staff person, correct? Yes. Yes. Just so you know. So they'll be out at Public Works. Yep. So mm -hmm. this is conversation, frankly, is more interesting than going through a slide deck. So I'm, I skipped a bunch of stuff. Um, <laughs> I think that what I skipped basically was we're marketing to people to let them know our goals and the first thing proactive step we did was put people on p-time rebate we want them to experience that hey it matters when i use electricity and if i act in the way that's good for the grid there's a financial benefit to me and right now maybe it's turning off my lights or changing when i use my laundry or whatever um, but there will be technological solutions coming as well and we'd like people to kind of migrate from um, completely unaware to aware engaging behavioral programs to adopting technologies to the extent that they can afford them or they're useful for their particular circumstance um, this kind of gives you a sense of our overall project timeline so i said that we mistakenly on the 15th uh, on the 13th we enrolled everyone in peak time rebate uh, which you can see up here um, we're onboarding those outreach staff in the middle of next month and they'll be in the community um, and we're rolling into our active um, campaign starting in the fourth quarter of this year so you guys will see a, a lot of things in the community you'll see billboards there'll be um, print ads um, folks out in the community web ads banner ads um, talking about our programs and the design is to uh, the design is to try different framing. So we want you to do the same thing in every case, which is understand when you're using energy and how and, and change it for the benefit of the grid. And there, the first quarter, we're gonna do that in a very traditional utility way, which is if you do what we would like, we will give you money, which is how the utility generally interacts with our customers. Um, and we do that through um, thermostat incentives or demand response programs paying you to let us control your thermostat or the peak time rebate very traditional. Um, as we roll into this, the first quarter of next year, we're going to change the framing slightly and say, if you would like, you can take your peak time rebate incentive and give it to an, a nonprofit. So we'll have a list of nonprofits that customers can choose from and customers can donate their peak time rebate. So peak time rebates are a couple bucks per event but if everyone in a neighborhood contributes to a nonprofit, that can be a measurable impact, especially over a season we call multiple events. So we want to understand the extent to which redirecting those relatively small um, amount of incentive dollars, aggregating them up together and sending them to a nonprofit, if that results in customers participating more and participating deeper. Um, same thing in the, the renewable energy and the community engagement. Um, customer value proposition where we'll start doing some community competitions comparing uh, Milwaukee to Hillsborough, Hillsborough to, to uh, North Portland and 
seeing if we can get a little friendly competition between the neighborhoods to see if people are motivated then to do more. Um, also, this was a little, it's, it's combined there, there's a renewable energy, it says RE. Uh, for those who actually have enabling technology, like the heat pump water heater or electric resistance water heater with the smart switch, um, would those people turn over control in order to allow us to integrate more renewables? So allow us to, to preheat your water when, um, when the wind is blowing, when we have excess renewables on the grid, instead of sending it to California or, or um, curtailing it, shutting it down. Uh, in the third quarter, the framing will be around greenhouse gas abatement. So kind of making that link that Jason said that, you know, when, when the system's peaking, we're generally turning on fossil fuel-based plants and really explaining that to customers and saying, this isn't just good for the grid. If you, if you reduce your usage, you're saving us money, you're getting a rebate, and you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. To, again, see if that kind of moves the needle. And then finally, our last campaign is the going back to the giving back that we did the first time, which is coming in Q1, and just taking the lessons learned from that first campaign and tweaking it so we can go back to the field. Because we, we think that one has a lot of promise, so we want to do it twice apply our learnings and see if we can um, deliver a bigger impact. Um, from there, we kind of were regulated utilities, so we launched into our evaluation period, and our evaluator will come back and look at the data and say, here's what we found. But we're actually engaging our evaluator throughout this process so we can learn at the end of each quarter. And if we find really impactful results in our messaging campaigns, we want to roll those into our service territory-wide learning. So um, in, a really, in a real way, uh, Milwaukee and Hillsboro and North Portland, you guys are helping us um, optimize our program delivery and messaging and, and um, kind of taking the learnings from this test bed and pushing it out to the rest of the service territory. Uh, down here at the bottom, these are, these are products that are coming out on the market. So right now we have smart thermostats available, multifamily water heaters are available, and peak time rebate. Those are the things that we have in market. And we have um, a plan to get additional products in market, so those will be coming out in the next couple quarters. Um, it's a lot to digest, but that's, so that's is, the timeline. Like we have a new apartment building going in downtown. Is there any work with them to try and get them? Is that the one up by the golf Axel, course? Axel Tree. Axel Tree. It's on. No, it's downtown Milwaukee. It's on uh, Washington. Washington and yeah, Maine. It's the five story. It sticks, it sticks up over everything else in downtown. You're, you're thinking of Waverly Greens with the solar yes. yeah. installation. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm thinking of. That one's actually across the street from the test bed. It's just outside. Yeah. It just pains uh, me. I know. Um, uh -huh. There's another one in North Portland where the guy called me. He's like, I want to do all the things. And I'm like, yeah, I can't help you. I'm really well, sorry. so that's, I mean, they did the rooftop solar, which yeah. was awesome. But no, this is a brand new building under construction that's supposed to open yeah. in October or November. So they're putting in all new appliances. I would love they to They seem to, to be the somebody to talk to to get. Definitely. Yeah. They, if they're, if they've broken ground in their building, they probably have a, a budget and a plan that. I think they've already installed. Everything's may not, installed. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm definitely open to talk to them. Yeah. And Jason and I are trying to, we're in, we have latitude from the commission um, to try different things, and we don't have the traditional cost effectiveness uh, requirements that we would normally have because they want us to learn, and they don't mind if we fail. So I'm I'm happy to talk to anyone. Um, so we have about ten minutes left. So this is kind of we've been working diligently. And we're, we're about to go to, a lot of work happened before we even got to um, the PTR conversion. This is just to say that we've been active. Um, these are the test bed areas. So this was called Overlook, now we're calling it North Portland to be a little more accurate. And the reason these are so weird and they look like um, a gerrymandered congressional district is because um, this is the this is the current routing of our distribution infrastructure served by a particular substation, and it doesn't follow any logical political lines or boundaries. It's just engineering. Um, Hillsboro, and down here in southern Hillsboro, there's a massive new development going on, and, and one of the products that we're working on is a new, is a, a residential new building bundle where we're trying to put all these technologies together, working with the builder. So when the home, when the homeowner purchases a home and walks in the door, they have a smart thermostat connected, a water heater, an EVSE that's ready to do charging, and it's solar ready with storage. So 
trying to see if we can cram all that in there. There's not a ton of new building happening in the in the Portland metro area outside of this, but in the service territory, broader there is. And one of the reasons that we picked Hillsboro, actually I should get to that, the three test bed areas together represent the diversity of our of our customer base. So North Portland's kind of that traditional, smaller, craftsman, 20s, 30s customer, gas heat, not a, not a lot of big loads. Hillsboro's new construction, um, bigger homes, wealthier customers. And Milwaukee is where all of our diversity is. We have multifamily, single family, old homes, new homes, mobile homes, small businesses. So this this portion of the test bed is, I think, has the, the most interesting opportunities for learning. And we're kind of leaning on this community to give us that diversity of perspective. Um, and Milwaukee, which we talked about. I have a picture at the end. Um, I realize this is not Milwaukee. I realize this is a little bit of Milwaukee, the, a critical part of Milwaukee and um, Oak Grove. And I have a map that shows you kind of where that line is. I'm sure you guys are all well aware that where that line is. <laughs> um, but we say Milwaukee because it includes your downtown. And Peter's been great and super active participant in the program. So um, we're calling it the Milwaukee section of the test bed. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're interested or your constituents are inter interested, there is a easy to find test bed web page and there are interactive maps and you can type in your address and you can see exactly where you fall in or out of the boundary. Um, Jason mentioned that we're hiring community representatives. Uh, we're in the process of interviewing them now. Um, interviews are actually this week, the first round, and Peter's going to participate in the second round. And we're trying to find folks that have um, experience doing outreach, folks that have experience working with diverse communities that are bilingual, that can really get out and help us understand how your, um, your constituents are interacting with our programs and, and if, they, if they get it, if they understand it, if we're meeting their needs um, and make sure that we're getting as much learning as possible. And kind of in conjunction with these community reps, which are special PTE employees who are just focused on this, we're also working with our existing employees who do everything from they work on a line crew or they're in the customer call center. Anyone who is a Portland general employee and lives in one of these three test beds is part of, it has been invited to be part of our ambassador program. And our thinking here is these guys are part of the community and they're gonna be on next door, they're gonna to go to the farmer's market, they're going to experience this like, like your citizens are gonna experience it. So they will be able to provide us uh, better insights than any paid employee could who's kind of out there knocking on doors and talking to folks. So we're hoping there'll be our eyes and ears. Um, and this is already up and running. We've, we're engaging them, they, they're up to speed on what we're doing in the test bed. They've seen a very similar presentation. If they're eligible, we're, we've given them smart thermostats, they can experience the technology, so they're ready to answer questions and kind of be frontline front line ambassadors. Um, almost done talking. Phase two, so I had that timeline and it ended and I said we're gonna start evaluation. As we approach the end of that timeline, we're going to be um, engaging with the commission to have a phase two of the test bed, which is gonna be more focused on advanced um, technologies. So smart inverters for solar, more storage, active load management where we're, instead of doing seasonal event calls, we're kind of controlling stuff all the time. And we're, we're moving towards taking another big step towards that active load management matching with um, intermittent renewables. Uh, and this is part of our larger uh, smart grid plan. And this is the map I referred to. This is the last slide. But I just wanted to show you guys. This is zoomed in. Um, the test bed is based on everything served by the island substation. And the city boundary actually cuts right through the middle of that substation, mm. which I thought was pretty interesting. So it's so a little more than half of it is actually south, but it, it hits downtown. Um, and some pretty critical customers and loads in Milwaukee. And that's all I have. If you guys have questions. It's fascinating. I think we're pretty good at asking questions during presentations. <laughs> so. cool. Yeah. We're right on four minutes early. So. Thank you for the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the team has talked about how great it's been working with you. Um, and we're excited to see what comes out 
So thanks for choosing Milwaukee, and we're, we'll be there with you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And Council President, I need to excuse myself. Yep. Thank you. So next up, we have Home Energy Score Program. Uh, Oh, and same faces. I, I, yeah, same faces. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it over to, to Natalie to, to, to talk about, uh, follow up some, some of the questions that we had from our last presentation uh, in July, mid-July that we gave on the energy score. Uh, we wanted to follow up on the, on the questions that we, we had. There was also some things that I don't think we got a chance to cover that night because there was a lot that we, we had there. Uh, so. I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. She's going to uh, take it over. Andre. Uh, uh, I'm going. It's the powerful. She's going to fight with the computer first. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, hey, guys. So my name is Natalie, Climate Action Sustainability Coordinator for the city. Um, as Peter mentioned, you know, we, we came to you guys in July with this program, and I wish we had five more hours to talk about it. Um, but hopefully we can at least touch on an overview of it and then the specific questions and asks you wanted staff to go and explore. Um, so I just want to set the framework for why, you know, why we're so interested in this program. So, uh, you know, as, as you are aware, we adopted carbon reduction goals, and that's both uh, complete carbon neutrality by 2050, but even in the immediate future, we have carbon zero by 2035 from electricity and by all building fuel types by 2040, which is right around the corner. Um, so in our greenhouse gas inventory, which is this pie chart on the right, you can see that residential buildings is 18% of our sector-based emissions. So that is the energy that you're using in your home. And the hard part about that is a lot of it we cannot control, right? So it's not like we can make people sign up for a renewable energy program. Uh, and so the best way to control emissions coming from the residential sector in the easiest way is through conservation, so energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is uh, just decreasing the amount of energy you have to use to do the same task, right? Um, so an energy efficient appliance, for example, you don't have to use as much electricity or gas or any other fuel type to do the same job that you would with a more energy hog appliance. And the homes are the same way, right? So we have insulation, different types of windows, building structures that make a home more energy efficient. But the hard part is that's really difficult to see, especially if you're not familiar with insulation types or you're not familiar with the differences between windows. I know I'm not. Uh, so what came out of this awareness that people have a hard time visioning energy efficiency is a methodology from the US Department of Energy to score residential buildings on how energy efficient they are. Make it really simple, give them a one to 10 score. Um, and that's the Home Energy Score Program. There's a whole bunch of other different types of certification programs that exist out there that have existed through time. Uh, the federal program started in 2012. Uh, it's a methodology, really. And then uh, cities as well as states can adopt it as a, as a voluntary or a mandatory program to implement in their own communities, which is what Milwaukee is interested in doing. That's what Portland did, uh, Berkeley down in California, um, Austin, Texas also has a different program that works through their utility. Um, the difference is that they, you know, control their own utility. And so it's, um, they have some differences in program framework as well. So Portland, though, is a, is a prime example. So they started their program in 2018, January 1st, 20, uh, 2018. Um, and they see it as a way to encourage energy efficiency in the home through operational behavior. So operational is when you're turning on and off your lights. Right? It's like what you do day to day. Um, encourage an energy efficient housing market. So having customers or buyers when you're out there looking at homes just generally aware of the energy efficiency in a clearly explained way. And then as well as provi uh, providing residents pathways to, to make retrofits on their own homes. So um, the, oh, we'll go over the scorecard really quickly again, but the scorecards have uh, recommended retrofits that have a 10 year payback on them and it provides a financing pathway for you to actually make those retrofits at a point in time when you're buying a house where you're already going to be investing in a home. You're already opening up those new loan products. So this is just kind of like providing you more benefit and just 
at the right time. So if you want to participate, you can. Um, and so looking at the, the benefits of a home energy score program, the challenge of having an 18% uh, emission sector from residential buildings, uh, Milwaukee Climate Action Plan directly called out adopting Portland's residential energy score program, which is why we're here today. So just to go briefly over again what the home energy reports and scores look like. So the home energy score program consists of full reports, which has a score in it. So the reports are the piece of paper. It's a two-sided piece of paper. And the score is just from 1 to 10. The report has all that information. It breaks down the estimated utility costs based on the assets of the home, as well as the carbon emissions of the home, as well as the additional uh, retrofit opportunities. The score is just 1 to 10. So it makes it really simple if you're just browsing a bunch of different home types. The methodology from the US Department of Energy is an asset-based score. So home assets, you can see in the bottom of that triangle, those are things that when you're buying the house, they're coming with the house, right? It doesn't take into account when you're turning on and off lights or using, like leaving your windows open, right? It doesn't look at utility bills because for one thing, that's a lot of personal information on your utility bills. But another thing is when you're buying a house, it doesn't matter what the family before you did because you might be acting totally differently. And so you can see the scorecard on the very right um, and it's broken down. And this is the Oregon Department of Energy version, which is what Milwaukee's would look like. And the key thing with this is that the methodology that the US Department of Energy created, the idea is for it to be general. So it can apply to all different types of housing, all different types of climate. Replicable, meaning that it's a very kind of calculated methodology that any assessor can go in and do. And affordable. So it doesn't do blower door tests. It doesn't do really complicated um, testing that would keep the assessor in your home, therefore costing you more money. Um, especially in a market like Portland, which is pretty saturated in assessors, how uh, these assessments range from about $140 to, you can see somewhere up in the 200s, but it's usually $140 to $150 is what I've been seeing through browsing around assessor costs. Are these, uh, before you leave this slide, mm -hmm. so is there any relation to, other than just, you know, the assets are on the bottom and behavior sort of at the top, um, is there any relation to, you know, like things being lower on the pyramid? I mean, the way that it looks, you know, is there relation to sort of, you know, location on the triangle and size of the square? Yeah. Or, sorry, polygon. Um, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't uh, great at geometry. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and their effect on scoring. You know, um, I'm not sure. This is out of the U.S. Department of Methodology. Uh, Department of Energy's methodology handbook, I would not be surprised if there was. Just looking at it, it looks like it's more um, shifting upwards in behavior, right? So mm -hmm. like a heating, hot water ducts, and cooling, that's all like around personal comfort, right? So it has maybe it's more adjustable versus something like local climate and number of stories, which is fairly permanent in terms of their effects. That's what I was reading out of it. Um, I could definitely look at it and I'll send you that um, methodology if you want to look at it in more detail. Well, yeah, because some things like orientation are on there, mm -hmm. which we've been told they're not taking into account in this kind and we'll of assessment. Go over that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting that they even put that on there. Because it's, I think what it is is these are all of the assets of the home that contribute to the score, mm -hmm. whether or not they go in and score them, like local climate, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get a change in your home's energy efficiency based on the climate that you're in. Instead, it's how is your home prepared for that climate, which is consistent no matter where you are. And that all ties back to the, the replic rec replicability of uh, the methodology. So in this pyramid, the, the three bottom layers are the only ones that are used in the home energy score. Correct. Because the other two are the things that you said aren't, don't really, like right. behavior of who's going to live right. in the home and how many lights they use and exactly. when they turn them off and on and, right. you know, and all of that kind of thing. But I'm kind of surprised that appliances are not down it's because in, people take them with them, right? Oh, okay. So, so it's that easy would, to remove. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's talk. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit more about vegetation, but the permanence of the asset yeah. is really what's important for the score. So where these does, scores can be eight years. They last eight years. So where does the 
um, $1,257 come in? How do they arrive at that figure if they're not looking at utility bills? And I can't see the They look at average there, so. utility rates for the okay. region. Okay. So Oregon has cheaper energy than California. So that's yeah. going to factor into that estimated utility cost based on the assets that they score in the home. What they don't want to do is say, um, Natalie with her two cats is going to use the same amount of energy as a family of eight who's going to exactly. move afterwards. Well, that know? was one of my concerns on it. I thought, how can... Um, right. There's no compatibility, comparison, whatever you want to call right. it. Right. Yeah. So what is their their energy costs? Are they using a family of four or something? So they're their... using the average utility rates, um, and then they estimate the average household size right of your region uh -huh. and then that's how they generate the energy costs so is that only electricity or is that electricity All and natural types. gas but not water and stuff like that so it's just energy fuel so it's going to be oil natural gas energy and then they also will take out some money if you have solar right so they say oh you're going to be making that back in credits and what about if you have a fireplace and you use your fireplace more so than you turn on a heater there's so, no way to measure that those, well those think. those are yeah. being phased out <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they take it wood, but uh, I'll ask about that, about Not like wood, wood places. Well, I can ask about it. Yeah. I, I, one thing on the scorecard that I did want to point out, so that 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 score there shows a six. That's where what? The, the, the score on this uh, scorecard shows a six. The energy score for the, that home is a six. The nationwide average, uh -huh. and I think even in Portland, is a four. Okay. 4.3 in Portland is what they've been averaging, 4.7 nationwide. I think 4.7. Uh-huh. Okay. 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 So, um, so for one thing, I also wanted to mention, so this the scorecard is shown at time of listing. So these programs kind of shift depending on when people are required to get a score. Sometimes they're time of closing when you're selling a house. Sometimes they're time of listing. Portland's is time of listing. Uh, we're interested in time of listing as well because not only are there potential benefits for people if they'd like to make these retrofits, right? There's potential benefits of people reducing their energy uses if they go in knowing how much the house may be using. But more than anything, this is just added information when you're shopping for a mm -hmm. home, right? So the nice part, the difference between time of closing and time of listing is that by the time you're already at time of closing, you've already invested in that home, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to walk away from anything. And, and I know there's some questions about um, uh, home inspections and why, why can't this just be roped in a home inspection? Well, it can for that amount of cost, but you're already paying for the home inspection, right? So it's going to be a difference of, it cost me, I think, $450 for my home inspection versus $150, and I would have known I'd be spending over $2,000 on mm -hmm. utility costs, right? So it's just more consumer protection when it comes into having these available on a publicly advertised home listing. Yeah. It, it seems to me like it would also be easier to, if you were going to make some changes, wrap those costs into the mortgage negotiations right. with your bank when you know it at time of listing versus time of closing. Because yeah. you're pretty far down the road with the bank by the time you're closing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same as when we're talking about like renewable energy programs, right? If you're a business and you're setting up a new business in Milwaukee, the opportune moment is when you're setting up, right? Yeah. Like you're already calling PGE, you're already going to be asking them to set up a new account. It's just a lot easier for you to wrap in, oh, and by the way, can it be green source or can it be clean wind? Versus if we came to somebody who was in their home and they didn't want to talk to a bank on a Wednesday, if we said, hey, here's these financing options, it's just not convenient. Right. Well, the ideal situation like this is it's convenient, right? You're already kind of going through this complicated process. Here's a little bit more information for you on the mm -hmm. start of it, rather than being already in the weeds. Okay. Um, and so, and it's also so it's a, a publicly advertised uh, listing. And I know that there were was a um, a statement that was submitted asking about Zillow's. Um, program on make me move listings, which is where you post a higher than market home sale price. So that's still a public listing for a house, right? Mm -hmm. So even though you may not take an offer less than it, you're advertising your home for sale, which is why this information would want to be out there. Um, so this is the Home Energy Score program flexibility. 
So we know that our neighbors to the northwest, the inferior neighbors of Portland, because Milwaukee is superior, um, <laughs> they have a home energy score program. And so they did a lot of work on their home energy score program to talk to the real estate industry and to talk to regional stakeholders. And that's how they got to where they were. If Milwaukee wants to implement a program, we just want to make sure we have something that's compatible with that program, considering that a lot of Portland addresses are actually in Milwaukee and some Milwaukee addresses are in Portland, and you're going to have realtors working in both markets. And so the nice part about the program that we've um, brought to you today is that it aligns fairly well with Portland's program, but there's still these points of flexibility. So the program foundation is based on that methodology that's from the federal government which can't really change without being of deviation and a totally new methodology and a new program. It's and you said there's a, there's actually a state program. So all the state is doing mm -hmm. is serving as like a proxy partner. Mm -hmm. So when you are the size of Portland, right? Mm -hmm. So Portland can partner directly with the US Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And there's a list of requirements to participate and partner and use this methodology. Mm -hmm. That's stuff like you have to have at least 500 listings. You have to have people doing quality assurance. You have to have all of these checks and balances in place, which is a lot of resources for smaller communities. Oregon Department of Energy is interested in helping smaller communities implement this program. And so, for example, Oregon Department of Energy already uh, contracted with Earth Advantage to do quality assurance and quality checks. And so by serving as a proxy partner, so we're partnering with Oregon Department of Energy, who's partnering with US Department of Energy, we don't have to have those listing number requirements, so we don't have to meet a minimum number or quota. We don't have to do our own quality assurance. Um, essentially, they're just going to have a lot of other smaller communities in the region. Beaverton's interested. Corvallis is interested. Um, Nobody's done it yet? Well, Portland has done it, but Beaverton and um, Corvallis are in the process of exploring. I've been participating in a working group, and they're essentially in the same process of us as, as trying to figure out how it suits their communities and bringing it to their elected of officials. A lot of other communities are waiting until they adopt a climate action plan in order to actually kickstart it. Um, but it's in a lot of people's climate action plans. And, and Eugene has a, a I was going to say, I would have program. expected yeah. Eugene to have you, one. Eugene yeah. And Ashland, you. probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they also, they have a different relationship because they are the utility versus us where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we work with PGE. Um, and but so... Why, but why would that... Why would that be different on, the, on a voluntary basis? Why would that affect whether or not it could be a voluntary? I thought it was voluntary if we do it. Uh, well, no, it's definitely not voluntary I don't think if it we do it. it doesn't, it's, At least yeah. that's not the program that we've been presenting. Uh, the voluntary program that Eugene has isn't affected by the relationship with the utility. No, and it's so also, that's still flexibility here. But it's a different type, I believe it's a different type of certification program as well. It's still an energy efficiency certification program, but I don't know if it's the same U.S. Department of Energy methodology one. So there's a bunch of different types of certification programs that exist. Earth Advantage has a home energy efficiency certification program that they were hosting. Uh, um, energy Trust of Oregon has an energy performance score program. The, the nice part about this one is that um, it's, it's really well known now, it's replicable, and assessors are already trained to do it. So there's more, uh, there's a cheaper uh, way to get it done rather than contacting Energy Trust of Oregon and having to go through their more extensive program. And again, it meshes with what's already expected in the market yes. because Portland has adopted this. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, the mandatory program, so that just means that people are required to do it when they're listing their house. Once again, this isn't just everyone in Milwaukee needs to get it done right away. It's only as people's homes are listed. Um, and then it's at time of listing rather than time of close on the mortgage. But you can see compliance, the administrative processes, the exemptions, the scorecard appearance, low income assistance, all of these we can put our own touch on. Right? We can change the, uh, everything except for essentially the basics of this program. And the reason why we can't change the methodology is because it's the US federal government methodology and it'd be really difficult and a long process. 
um, and we'll go into touching on some of the other uh, requests that you guys look for us to explore. But what I do want to mention is so compliance. So if we would like, so Portland's program has a 90 day compliance window. So they get a notice of violation, they have 90 days before there's a $500 fine. So what does violation mean? Meaning um, staff is going checking a public listing and there's no home energy score on there. So then they get notified that, oh, hey, you're in violation of city code. You have 90 days to fix it or else you're going to get a fine. And but I do want to make sure that we look at what that time of listing actually means and what triggers that because I don't, I mean, you know, yeah. that definitely, I mean, the, the issue raised, you know, with the question about make me move, that is not a, that's not a listing. Your yes. home is not listed for sale. Yeah. So you anytime you're, on. anytime you are advertising a home for sale, um, like a make me move a lot of times you have to that is a public listing so you are there's a um the terminology in the real estate industry and how the city code in portland defined it um there needs some clarification on public advertising but that's how they've been moving forward is essentially when you're publicly advertising even, even if it's like an a-frame sitting in front of your house saying this house is for sale and there's no online posting that's listing your house for sale. In the real estate industry, time of listing could begin even before the home is publicly advertised, mm -hmm. but the way that the code is written, it enforces the public advertisement, not the, the process of listing your home with a real estate agent or a broker, or if you're a construction site and you're building homes, but they're not publicly listed for sale yet. But that's one of the questions I think that came out of our last meeting which was, you know, we might like to, we might like to explore an option of what time of listing means and who it, who's getting enforced on, right? I mean, last time we talked about this, we talked about potentially, you know, the, the, the person who's being enforced on is actually the listing agent. So we'll go over that for realtors mm -hmm. as the regulated party. Um, there are some challenges with that, but we can continue to explore sure. it. Um, so, so there's still some flexibility for all these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the questions that you asked of us to explore further and then bit by bit we'll see what uh, suggestions you have. So these are the ones, these are the key takeaways from the July 16th work session. There was trees and exterior home features, so awnings, um, balconies. There's exemption modifications, so exemptions, those are the situations in which someone does not need to get a home energy score. There's the realtors as the regulated party, and then there's the low income assessment portion of this. So trees, I'm gonna break it up to trees and exterior features. So trees are non-permanent structures, especially in Milwaukee when we don't have a, a private property tree code right now, which means tomorrow somebody can take down a tree on their in their property. These scorecards are good for eight years, so that's, a lot of time for people to, to change the vegetation on their home. Um, the, also, the issue with trees being included in the Home Energy Score program is there's seasonality, right? So in the winter time, it's going to be more difficult to see what species of tree it is, but then also a tree may fill out and provide more shade during the summer versus the winter. So those utility costs are going to change and the impact on the home energy efficiency will change over the seasons. Um, in addition, it's gonna change the affordability of the assessment because the assessor now has to go out and assess the vegetation on the property. And they also have to have some training in vegetation identification, right? You need to know what's a, a broadleaf and evergreen um, and how that's gonna impact the energy efficiency of the home for both wind breaking as well as shading. Um, and then the ubiquity of the home energy score assessment that also ties into the fact that um, different types of vegetation are going to have different impacts on energy efficiency. So even this is a federal methodology. So Arizona's methodology for tree and vegetation impacts are going to be vastly different than Oregon's based on the mm -hmm. different species at play. Um, and then, so if we were to ask U.S. Department of Energy to go through and add in trees and vegetation, that would kickstart a whole different redevelopment process because the packet for their methodology, uh, um, how it how it works is is pretty thick, and so they'd have to redo all of their calculations. And um, but if we're interested, we've asked Earth Advantage and Oregon Department of Energy if they would want to ask that conversation, start that conversation. Um, but I think the issues mentioned before, revolving around the non permanence and the seasonality and the additional costs, might dissuade people from including them in the methodology. 
Um, but one solution that we may have is working to add a disclaimer on the scorecards, essentially acknowledging that trees can be energy efficient and that for more resources, go to this site um, and essentially just starting the conversation as you're looking at the scorecard that trees have value to the energy efficiency of the home. Um, the thing is, these scorecards, since we're partnering with the state to help with this program, there's a stakeholder group that Milwaukee's a part of. We essentially just have to get stakeholder group buy-in to say, hey, is this okay to add this disclaimer? Um, I'm sure it would be fine because it would just be, you know, local flavor to the scorecards, but uh, that's something that we might just have to make sure we get stakeholder agreement on. So trees... I mean, I think, I mean, you kept using the word vegetation, and I think it really, we are talking about trees and not, you know, shrubs. Right. Um, and shrubs have some windbreak value, I guess, potentially. But the trees that have, you know, that contribute to cooling a home mm -hmm. or keeping or protecting a home from winds uh, are necessarily pretty big, pretty mature trees, right? They're not going to be your, you know, little thing you planted two years ago. Um, yes, people can take them down. Yes, trees get diseased, they get harmed by weather. You know, there, there are things, but I think, you know, most people who have a large tree close to their home to give shade are not gonna be taking them down. Uh, certainly I think the eight year, you know, if this was a forever thing, that might be different, but the eight year thing, you know, I would bet that you know, the vast majority of the trees are still there after eight years. Um, so, so I, I, I think really that the big, the big part of this, it's just not part of the, the home energy score methodology right. that was developed by the Department of Energy. And, you know, the, the certification process that the assessors go through, the training process, that's not part of what they assess. So, uh, to add that to that, without everybody else doing it, it's it's like a really, it's an impossible lift for Milwaukee to do that. So I think, you know, what Natalie was suggesting and what we thought about was, you know, adding some language to our personalized Milwaukee home energy scorecard about, you know, hey, trees in your yard provide benefits, you know, the shading, wind breaks, and those are things that affect how you use energy in your home is, mm -hmm. is the way to handle that without, changing the assessment methodology and protocols or, or mm -hmm. because I, there's just really not a method not a way for us to do that on our own i think there there might be other disclaimers then that that would be valuable if, if we're you know that, that i think could could help alleviate some of the concerns at least that i have around you know some of the discussion that we had about you know a DIYer like me who mm -hmm. might insulate her own home and not have a receipt because you know what a receipt looks like after just a couple of years in a box. It's completely faded, you can't read it. Therefore, I have zero evidence that I've done this work. I think that, you know, some disclaimer that, that says, you know, that, that these, that the, that these, that the inspections have limitations mm -hmm. and some description about what those limitations are, that, that there was no physical inspection of things like insulation or you know even windows yeah, you're not good, even you're not even physically inspecting the windows someone could have you know got a great deal on some windows from their brother-in-law mm. you know and put and installed them themselves none of that is being reflected on this thing those are the things that i have a hard time with it's sort of like mm -hmm. the real life well the windows are visible right so they get but they're not judged but, but what i understood from the last time is that it's your receipt and it's it's what tell what you see on the so invoice so if it's visible like a window so what they're just not opening walls just the same That's as you get a home yeah. inspection yeah. they're not opening walls right so, so then du okay only... so then duct work things like that there are lots of things that yeah. are being included oh, on the score that are not physically inspected so and just as just with a home inspection where a lot of it is at face value the nice part is you're not invested in this home when you're looking at these home energy scores at this point right so this is information that's just available to you when you're browsing right different homes for sale it's true that there's going to be inclusion of projects that um, aren't accounted in the home energy score right um, but I think 
that's the, the replicability and the ubiquity of this is that it's surface level, right? It's cheaper than in home inspection because they don't go into that much detail. You're right, there needs to be some outreach and messaging regarding what does this score really mean? What's potentially not included in this score? We'll talk about that with exterior features as well. Um, but the, the, the goal of this is just to be very broad in general. And there is gonna be a lot of stuff that's not included in the fine details. Um, a lot of times, it's mostly the insulation. That's the challenge because you can't, you know, open up walls to look at it. And if you didn't keep a receipt for any insulation that you did, they just go on. Okay, well, what's this type of house average insulation used? Yeah, and I think that that's an easy. I think that's a bro an easy broad disclaimer to make. Mm -hmm. Oh, know? absolutely. And, and wording yeah. can be finessed, but mm -hmm. it, it should be, you know, some, that there are limitations on on what is and is not included in this yes. assessment, including true. physical inspection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, so exterior building features, these are um, also similar and that's pretty subjective to the assessor going through and adding it to the methodology. It doesn't exist right now, so it'd be a pretty big push to have them include it. I also want to include a little feature right here because this is very true with my house, right? My house has these little awnings over the windows that shades the big windows that are single pane that this house has. Um, and it does provide some cooling to my home, but that's also seasonal. Right during the summertime, when the sun goes in the perfect pathway, I get that shading. In the winter time, the sun comes straight through the window, um, and so. But that's good, actually, because you want the sun coming not through the window. Not single. My living room gets pretty darn hot in the winter time. It's like yeah. a greenhouse. It's yeah. amazing. Um, but I still don't turn on the AC because I'm a true worker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I suffer. Uh, anyways. But, but yeah, so it's it's just not included in the assessment right now. It's seasonal, it's hard. It would just add difficulty to the assessment to include, which would change the replicability. See, of this is where I think the Department of Energy has, you know, is being inconsistent with their own pyramid because this is about the orient, this is, well, it's not the same as orientation, but it's related. And it's the features on a house that, um, you know, especially on older homes that were, that's exactly what they were designed for. Was the hard cooling. part is, is when you are doing the assessment and you're out in the field, what are you taking data about, right? So they, they can't go on your roof. They, they can't get out there with a ruler and actually see the overhang. If the sun is not out at that moment, how are they going to know how much shading is that, that awning causing? You're right. It does have impact. Talking to an assessor, the impact's not that great to justify the increased cost that it would incur in the assessment. Um, but I think this is something that could be roped in in a disclosure saying that there's features on a house, just as there's features in the vegetation that could impact energy efficiency of a home. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just a, perhaps an inherent flaw of a very general methodology. So maybe this is where I want to ask you guys the question. So. Knowing that there's impacts from trees and exterior building features, right? But that we're trying to use this established federal methodology, and it's a very general and broad methodology. Would you be okay if we just acknowledge through a disclosure statement on the scorecards or pursue adding a disclosure statement on the scorecards that there are other additionalities to this score that should be taken into Such consideration? Is, yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so the exemptions. So as I mentioned, exemptions are when you don't have to get a home energy score. Um, this is usually the, the list of exemptions that are included in the administrative or the, the city code. Um, include stuff like pre-foreclosures, foreclosures, trustee sales, which is when it's essentially <coughs> another indication of foreclosure. Um, there's also ones that revolve around like a condemned home. Those we're gonna leave as is because um, you know, if the home is unsafe to enter, nobody should be going in there to do a home energy score, from our opinion. Um, but we did hear that um, that you, council is interested in, in having, especially the banks, pay their share, right? So when the bank is owning the property, making sure that they're not getting a free pass for having a home energy score. So looking into this, the challenge is in a lot of these pre-foreclosures, trustee sales, uh, short sales, the ownership is kind of a gray area because the homeowner could still be the resident, right? The title owner. And they're just trying to sell the house at 
to come out neutral to give the money back to the bank because they're already owing money to the bank and that's why they're selling their home. Um, that I think was the true intent of providing these exemptions is saying that you don't have to pay anything extra on top of the fact that you're trying to just make back the money that you had in the home to give back to the bank. Um, a proposed modification that we had was requiring foreclosure sales. So at the time when the home is listed as a foreclosure, it is clearly a bank owned property, right? The resident may still be in the home, but the bank owns the title at that point. Um, so requiring foreclosure sales to disclose home energy scores. Um, the only issue with that is that um, banks also sell these loans between each other. So finding the, the current owner, I call the tax assessor's office. They don't get that information until the home is essentially sold to a different resident. Um, that information, there's like only a few situations where they actually have to disclose that information as different mortgage brokers. Um, so it's just on the compliance side. That might be a little difficult to make sure that we're um, getting actually that notice of violation out to them. Talking to Tim, uh, Tim Sellers, and uh, our code compliance coordinator, he was like, yeah, I'll go for them. Uh, I have no problem with, with sending them letters. It's just whether or not they're going to comply after those 90 days. We don't know. Um, and then I also added the, the create some confusion between the Portland program, Milwaukee program. That's something that we heard, especially from the Portland Association of uh, Metro Association of Realtors, just that as you're a real estate agent, it's just a different rule that's different between the communities. I don't think it'd be too difficult, but it's just something that, that would potentially occur. And so I would just have to make sure as the staff monitoring this program that we make sure people know. And the compliance piece with foreclosures too, sort of based on economic conditions on, you know, when the economy's doing well, there's not as many foreclosures. Sure, right. So right. When, when it's doing poorly, there, you're gonna have more foreclosures that may, we might have to spend some more time on, but. And, and Do we have a sense of like, how many foreclosure sales Portland's had or, or you know, how many exemptions they've given for that? Or? I'm not sure on that. They haven't given that many exemptions, period. I think it's only something, last time I checked, it was like 70 exemptions out of the over 10,000 homes that were scored. Um, for Milwaukee, uh, there's not that many foreclosures even on the market right now. So if I'm only for compliance, and we can go into the weeds on compliance, but I'm only checking about 10% of the market as just going through and browsing and seeing for compliance. So 10% of maybe nine homes that are on the market right now, I would maybe check one or two, maybe, depending on the odds. Um, so there's just not that many in Milwaukee, but um, it's, it's really the hard part is that for foreclosures, when they're displaying a listing, there might not be a homeowner at the address. So our, our current compliance process is sending a letter in the mail to the residents. Okay. And so the bank's not there. Um, and then we can try to go through whatever realtors listed on the home listing, but sometimes there's not a realtor listed. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the challenge will just be making sure that information's getting to whoever owns the title at that point. I think it's almost more a, <laughs> a political point on some level. Oh, absolutely. You know, and that's not, why we're, we're unlikely to get great compliance but yeah oh absolutely saying, and that's hey. why we think that it's you know it's not a problem I mean right. if anything it's easier on staff for some situations because we don't have to get exemption paperwork coming through um, and it does send the message saying that hey just because your bank doesn't mean you don't have to comply to this program um, it's just I want to acknowledge so that way when we do an evaluation of the program if it's adopted if we don't have very high compliance on that that might just be why um, so, thinking about this, are there any changes that you guys would like to make to the originally proposed exemptions? So the originally proposed exemptions included foreclosure as an exemption, as well as pre-foreclosure, uh, trustee sale, short sales. I, I mean, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me to to exempt foreclosures when when it's the when it's a bank-owned property and that is the to do what with foreclosures? to exempt foreclosures. Yeah, well, I think no, banks I should. The banks, yeah, do, no, banks do that. can do it, and uh, yeah. and I don't really care that the real estate agents. Right. Might find I'm it. no, I don't care about that. Quite frankly, I'm more concerned about financial distress in a person who owns a home, right. mm -hmm. who something happens, 
hypothetically, let's say they lose their job, and so they're going to have to move in with mom and dad, so mm -hmm. they're going to sell their house. I am more concerned about those kind of people than I am about the yeah. banks or any other mm -hmm. financial institutions. Yeah, no, and I, so yeah. I wondered, and one of the questions I had asked you was, you know, are we considering or can we other types of financial distress because the only ones that are we're talking about here the are hard part is setting up qualifications for it so we'll run through our, our low income assistance one um and we can go into that yeah. on, on how we would qualify those individuals um but i just don't want to do things that are going to cause people like all of us to have to pay more money when they may not have the wherewithal well, to do that. Right. It's hard enough when you have to sell your own home if it's a financial distress situation. The next if you're part, selling it to move up, that's one thing. Well, and but, even and also getting yeah. notice of something that isn't your responsibility. I mean, if you are, if you, you know, if a, if a home has been listed as for as a foreclosure and you happen to still be living there because that actually happened on my street right. for quite some time. Yeah. If that, if you're getting the notice because it's just simply being sent to the mailing address, and you get this notice that says, by the way, you're being fined or you're going to get fined mm -hmm. by the city of Milwaukee because you have it, and you're like, wait, I'm not even the owner of this house. They're just letting me squat here. Right. right. <laughs> so that's why that's why we'd have to have well, clear language on any sort thing, of public facing no. website about it. Yeah. But that's one of the challenges of pursuing foreclosures as an, a non-exempt situation yeah. is because there is all this weirdness Greenest. revolving who's in the house, who owns the house, who can actually do the assessment, because that's another issue is if it's a bank-owned property, the bank does definitely doesn't have those receipts, but they're not there. And can the bank schedule an assessment for somebody to enter that home with a resident there? But you know, we can't enforce on a non-owner, so right. it, you know it, it doesn't. I mean, it, and so that's the challenge that we're going to have to consider if we remove foreclosures as an exemption. Is that there's going to be potentially some tricky situations that we'll just want to make sure that we have. Uh, devote a lot of time to to talking and reassuring somebody through that process i mean it sounds like though that's the exemption you'd like to remove it's like uh, if it's if it's in foreclosure then we send the notice to the bank that's where it's going we're not giving the exemption for that so other but other properties that are in distress uh, and there was there was a natalie mentioned there's the, the list the, the list of those we're going to provide that exemption that you don't need to get that home energy score. Mm -hmm. So, but the bank, we're going to require the bank to do the home energy score, and yeah. we're going to seek compliance with the bank. And so the that's, nice part, that's, yeah. yeah. And that's the nice part at. too is that when a home is listed as a foreclosure, it's clearly defined as a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Things like short sales and trustee sales, they're not always unless you go to a public auction for a home. It's not always listed as such, so we wouldn't know if it's an exemption or not. It, it would be pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. Foreclosures, it's pretty clear when it's listed, yeah. and that way we can pursue compliance on it. Right. Um, so, so realtors as the regulated party. So, as I mentioned, with banks owning the property and the difficulty of having somebody in the home, that the, some similar issues come up with realtors. But what was really highlighted when we talked to PMAR was the fact that they have this, uh, the Oregon Revised Statute says that they may not essentially use commissions as a way to incentivize or pay for a service for a, um, a resident. Now, I, I, I was hoping Justin would be here, so I've sent this off to him, um, and he's looking at it in terms of the, the true legality of it. He had more concerns about um, other market issues like um, whether or not it's like a discriminatory practice for the market um, or whether or not it would have unintended impacts on the market. So for example, if you knew as a realtor that you'd be having to pay out of your commission sales for other home energy scores, would you choose not to take the lower cost homes that you wouldn't make as great of a commission on? Um, and that's, we don't know. For $150. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. Is, is, uh, I'm not worried about the market impact. So. Yeah. It's just something that would have to be considered. Um, additionally, there's a level of engagement that I don't know what the comfort level is. If, if we were going to roll out something like this as a regulated party, would we need to go through an additional engagement session with that industry? Um, and like I mentioned, I think the hard part is that um, 
you know, the, for, for one thing, a real estate agent is not, so there's like licensees for, for selling homes. There's also real estate agents, right, when they comply to a different type of process in an organization. There's also builders who sell homes, right? So if a builder is selling a home and they're advertising the home themselves, they are now the ones selling the home, so they're the regulated party for sale by owner, right? Essentially, as we start adding in all of these people selling home, it turns into the seller, right? It's only the people who would be advantageous to work with a real estate agent would have the real estate agent pay for them. So it just starts to get a little complex as we as we look at them as the regulated party. Um, and I'm particularly interested on on what Justin would have to say about whether or not it would be allowed. Um, well, I mean, I agree with you said in your staff report, uh, because it's an upfront cost and it's ubiquitous, um, it doesn't really seem to invoke this Oregon revised statute. And didn't That's we hear last was, time that they were doing it already? So if so they're really they, concerned about that, they wouldn't yeah. actually already be paying. Oh, are right? they already paying? We, we heard that from so our last So the thing is that they, I think, the way that the statute is written, they cannot be using the commission sales on that home to incentivize, right? Well, so they, they can't be saying, yet, if so you go not. with me, I'll pay for this home energy score. I, I believe, personally, that that's what this means. Um, then PMAR <laughs> says otherwise, but this is out of my playing field. But if it's broad-based in the city of Milwaukee, I mean, if we could word it that way, where it says, we have this program and it's paid for by the developer who's selling or the real estate agent who's yeah. You know, or the for sale selling. by owner. Or the for sale by owner. Or the for, yeah. sale, by or the for sale by owner. So I think yeah. it would just be Something clearly like that. defining who the If it's across the board, or they can't very is. well say that it's a bribe. It's, um, I, I just don't know what, the, what restrictions we have from yeah. a right. legal side. This is side. really a Justin question. Yes. Yeah. Um, You've been participating so we, in these statewide Oregon Department of Energy, and nobody else is talking about this? They, nobody wants to, to try to mess with it, is what I've but understood. Nobody, it's very, it's, there's only it, it, it opens up, it right opens now, up so a, a right. it's ridiculous, they should so. all be willing to do it. Well, the hard part is that it, for, one, for Portland to get the Home Energy Score program adopted, it took a lot of compromise and engagement with the, the real estate industry, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't want to pass it, period. And so they worked with them to establish this list of exemptions as well as the process. So that way they felt it didn't have a negative impact on their industry. So I think that the idea of them as well paying for the home energy scores was off the table. I also think that Portland's legal team thought that it was a, a can of worms not to open or best not to open at this time. Is that based on actual, I mean, I, I want to know if that's, if that, if that's a, if that's based on actual yeah. like, legal issue versus political issue. Yeah, because I'm not issue versus a political issue. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I want to make sure that we're asking Justin legal questions, not political questions, because it, right. that is a completely, that's a totally, yeah. that is I, a dividing line. That I think he's working sure on it right now based on the communication okay. I've had. He's probably him. at the planning commission right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably working on that um, right now. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm curious, though. Um, so why why should the realtor or a real estate agent pay for... Did you say why should or why, why should? Why, why should, should they pay for that? They're, they're there to provide a service to assist a, a property owner. I'm, I'm just asking. We'll have a higher level of compliance, so right? Because why? it'll be easier to educate, and they'll know. So yeah, it's and easier to send notice to a listing agent than it is to track down this this owner or whoever. And I think that we can define, you know, we can we can create any definition we want for seller. Mm -hmm. We're not limited by some legal anything. Right. We get to decide that. And so, including the seller as, as one of the seller options, you know, under the under the definition of seller, as you know, the listing agent, we'll have more compliance. We'll have more compliance earlier. Mm -hmm. um, people, if the whole point is to let the buyer be in fully informed, having it done by the real estate agent is the best way to get it. Yeah, and fully. some, I mean, I also, I, I, I was hoping that we would have some information about how many homes, because I thought we talked about this last time, um, how many homes are actually being sold 
right now currently in Milwaukee by, by agent or by owner? Because it's usually the vast, I mean, I don't see very many for sale mm -hmm. by owner signs. So that information no. yeah. is available on Redfin if you want to download the sheets of it. Mm -hmm. I know in aggregate our peak is probably 120 homes a month. That's a peak during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes, it drops down pretty drastically. I don't know if that information's broken down for sale by owner, for sale by real estate agent. Um, I think, you know, we could look into it further and definitely ask Justin what concerns he would have. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I would caution that, that if we did something like this, we just want to make sure to have a very extensive engagement process with the local real estate market because we don't want to dissuade anyone from practicing in Milwaukee. So I think we just make sure we want to partner it with an education and outreach and engagement process. Well, by the same token, we'd, if we put it on the burden of the person who owns a home and is living in it, we'd want to have extensive conversation with them right, ahead of time, too. So well, you know, services, any and all of those, the nice part is we'd want to do that. Services we can extend to homeowners that we cannot extend to real estate agents, Say right? Say that again. Mm -hmm. There's services that we can extend to homeowners who own property in Milwaukee that we cannot I believe we cannot extend to a real estate agent. Right? A service, Such oh, as we're not low income assess service. like low income assessments, for example. Oh, yeah. so we don't know what that real estate agent's income is, so maybe that $150 is a large portion of their income. Um, incentive programs for um, providing improvements to the homeowners, even if they're just listing their home, but they're maybe not going to intend to move yet. It's just we would want to make sure we know fully kind of how that would also impact that community, the real estate community. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to make sure we understand kind of like Let why me, we've been cautious in approaching this uh, option. Um, so. So we need to find out more. Do you want us to move forward with exploring uh, real estate licensees as the regulated party? Or is this something that you're for certain you want us to, to like, this is the default and unless otherwise proven? I'm not at that point yet. I, I just don't feel like I have a, enough of an understanding of the legal yeah. ramifications. And honestly, I, I am absolutely hearing and concerned about placing an additional burden on someone. There are so many costs. It is so expensive to sell a house. So expensive. I just did it with a house that I inherited. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. I mean, it takes thousands of dollars to sell a house. So when you, I'm not saying that $140 doesn't matter. But it if does you're make a difference. I it just does. said I'm I not agree. saying it doesn't matter. Right. But no, I, I don't know. want to lose sight of the greater context of yeah. this is a, a ridiculously expensive and horrible process. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that's. Hard the hard process. part, too, yeah. is, is that there is a yeah. very clear benefit to buyers, right? So you get a big benefit as you're right. purchasing a home in Milwaukee to see all of these scores. Right. The sellers do have a comp, like it is a burden on them to pay for this assessment, but that's also similar to when you're selling and buying a home, the real estate agent's fees are usually paid by the seller versus the buyer. The nice part is a lot of this is negotiable. There's nothing that says that you cannot tack on the assessment fee cost to either the seller or the buyer, right? You can negotiate that in the closing costs. There's nothing that prevents that. Um, it's just making sure we have a knowledgeable real estate industry and community to know that that's an option. Well, and I just think about the, um, I mean, you maybe aren't fully aware of it, but we've had a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of community members feeling like they haven't been informed about some land use things going on in the city that have been in the pilots multiple times <laughs> that have been, you know, uh, you know, that are, we think are fairly well known out there, but there, you know, there are a lot of people yeah. who are saying, you're going to do what on my block? Um, so if we have that, then this is just something, I mean, the idea that the, every homeowner is going to, whatever outreach we do, to me, it seems way easier to do the outreach to a, limit, a fixed number of real estate agencies um, than Well, to, and we do identify them as the pinpoint for a lot of this education. There's a lot of free services and, and webinars and educational tutorials that exist there. Earth Advantage does a training. Um, 
uh, City of Portland has been going around hosting trainings that if somebody is active in the Portland real estate market, they're going to be active in Milwaukee's market. There's a lot of resources for people to learn about it. We would just want to make sure we also extend that to our community members. Yeah. Um, and I also don't want to, I mean, the reason why we're proposing this program, for one thing, it was adopted in the Climate Action Plan, so obviously you guys have interest in it. But then another part is that 18% emission sector from residential energy, there's not a lot of good ways to curb that, yeah. except for conservation and energy efficiency programs. And until, I mean, Peter and I are working to explore options to put everyone on renewable energy in Milwaukee, but until then, conservation is the best way to save on greenhouse gas emissions. And even then, once people switch to renewable energy, as you just learned, the more we can reduce the stress load on the grid, the better. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're proposing this program to you guys. It's just something that, that's a tool in our toolkit to help us achieve our greenhouse gas emission mm -hmm. goals, especially in a sector that's very hard for us to have any sort right. of effect on. Right. And the hope is that we're leading the way. Absolutely. And that this is going to become the norm across the region and that across the country we will have houses having home energy score assessments right. that are, is just part of the process right. and it's part of the, the the global education project of teaching people how the way you live on the planet harms it or helps it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the nice part is even if you have no interest in energy efficiency whatsoever, there's the utility cost aspect of it. And I personally would love for every listing to have that information in it already, just yeah. because just as you know how many bedrooms and bathrooms there are, it'd be great to know the insulation and other assets mm -hmm. of the home. Um, Milwaukee is at the front of a wave of a lot of people adopting this program as a solution to meet both carbon goals, but also to reduce grid load. And um, there's a lot of communities around the nation. I've been participating in that group that has over 35 to 50 cities participating to, to implement the same program. Everyone is seeing the same challenges. Um, but the cool part is that Milwaukee stands out because we're a small community who's already taking action on some of the stuff and willing to try it out. Um, but I do want to talk to you guys, I know we don't have a lot of time left, about the low income home energy score assessment. So um, did you get an answer to your last question? Yeah. So what I'm assuming is that we're going to continue with the legal side of real estate licensees as a regulated party and we'll see what Justin says. Well, and mm -hmm. some of us know counselors in Beaverton that we could start <laughs> <laughs> suggesting why aren't you looking at at, at having this. Mm -hmm. We can take credit for this being a novel idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think there's there's the fear that the the out the uh, the engagement piece with the, the realtor. It's a really nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so so low income home energy score assessments so there was concern with the dollars being paid to contractors doing the assessments for leaving those communities. Uh, a nice solution actually lies within Portland's program. Portland contracts exclusively to Community Energy Project. That's a local nonprofit that does both energy efficiency engagement and outreach. They do incentive programs. They put in free heat pumps in people's homes. They have hotlines available for people with calls and questions. Uh, the way Portland works is that they just have a flat fee for an assessment, and when somebody needs to get an assessment done, they qualify. They send them to community, or they send their information to Community Energy Project, who then contacts that person okay. and, and schedules that assessment. Um, they also work with a lot of disadvantaged communities, a lot of diverse communities. They're, I met with them previously. They're a fantastic group. Um, Inhabit used to be really similar. Inhabit now. Um, delegated those responsibilities, or I should say um, Community Energy Project took up that opportunity to be the, the home energy score assessor. Um, so if you've heard them, the Inhabit and Community Energy Project, they kind of work really closely. Um, so the way Portland does it is they have a list of qualifications, and then, or you can do an attestation. The hard part is that's a lot of paperwork flying through. They have a secure system set up. Um, we would want to streamline it to fit Milwaukee's administrative uh, capabilities at this point. 
Um, and so we thought a great opportunity was to have people qualify through the existing utility assistance program. So they already have to, people are generally pretty familiar with that paperwork. We already have a database of people who are qualified through the utility assistance program. Uh, we could put out information on it on utility bills uh, for people to be aware of. And there's a secure system for people to submit paperwork to and personal identifying information. I could work, the finance, work with the finance department to talk to them to see who's qualifying. If somebody is not already participating in that program, they can sub qualify for the utility assistance program, check a box, say I also want a free home energy score. The, for those months that they're still in the house, they're going to get a discounted utility rate. So it's kind of like a win-win for people participating. Um, the nice part too is that um, like I said, it's it's more secure with their information. Otherwise, they'd be having to essentially send it to me and through my inbox, which isn't the same type of system. Um, and then once they qualify for that free home energy score, we can work with a single contractor like Community Energy Project to then go do those assessments and provide those services. And then that way they just invoice us. And I've already talked to them. They would be comfortable setting up a really similar baseline fee and that wraps up their administrative costs in it. Okay. If we wanted to do extended outreach, you know, we would we could set aside resources to do uh, continued outreach for that program. Talking to Community Energy Project, um, that I think is the one thing that they recommended was just increasing the amount of outreach of the availability of this service. Mm -hmm. There's about 180 customers, utility customers that take advantage of. Peter, I'm sorry, I can't I'm hear sorry, you. there's a, there's about 180 uh, utility customers that are on the low assistance program that the city offers. So and there's and also, not all of them are probably homeowners. Right. right. And and, and yeah. we would want to make sure no matter what whether what process we choose, there's a lot of um, services and incentive programs that exist through Energy Trust of Oregon and other nonprofits for low-income and disadvantaged communities, we want to make sure that people are aware that those services exist. We already want to make sure that they're aware through our housing affordability work as a city, so it just aligns. We want to make sure that there's extended outreach for other. So say somebody does want to make an improvement or a retrofit in their home, the cool part is Community Energy Project can help hook them up or at least explain the financing on it. Um, but we would also want to come with a suite of other possibilities for them. Mm -hmm. And that information, I believe is already on our housing affordability pages, but if we developed a home energy score program, we'd have, I'd create a new suite of different pages all about the program, and that would be on one of them. So, as defined, where we have the one pathway of qualification through our utility assistance program, and then once somebody qualifies, we work with a local nonprofit or assessor that has experience working with communities, both disadvantaged, diverse, or low income. Um, does this framework for a low-income assistance program uh, sound like a good possibility for this program, based on your opinions? Mm -hmm. Just to me. Awesome. <laughs> cool. And then I did hear that there was questions about compliance. Um, and so the compliance, um, this is how Portland has theirs set out. Um, with a little bit different on the back end for how Tim and I would work together. Um, Except that they haven't fined anybody yet. So they're just starting. <laughs> so they had difficulties because everything for their home energy score program was housed within Bureau of Planning Sustainability. Mm. And so they weren't working through code enforcement or compliance. So they had to figure out the pathway to find people and collect those funds. Mm -hmm. and when you're talking compliance or non-compliance, I just want to make sure and ensure that anybody that happens to be listening to this, you're yeah. talking about doing the housing, doing the assessment, not necessarily changing all the things. No. I mean, let's say they come up with where well, you really, right. you know, need no, new windows and you need yeah. to put more insulation. No, you do A person not have can to do choose anything. whether to do that or not, but at mm -hmm. least they still have the home energy yes. score. Right. You do not have to do anything exactly. that's recommended on that scorecard whatsoever. Right. But if There's you do, no you boost your abilities, Absolutely. especially. Yes. You know, if you're now in the process of trying to sell your home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. And we're hoping people will do that. I think there's like a 12 to 36 percent retrofit rate based on different studies done on home energy efficiency certification processes. But for compliance, all it is is when you have a publicly a listing, like you see right here with the Zillow listing, there's a, a URL in the, the 
bulk of that text and that's just a URL to the home energy score report. Mm. That's compliant right there. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'll be checking for. 10% um, of the listings in a given time frame, probably either bi-weekly or monthly, and then letting Tim know, hey, I saw this property address. It doesn't have a home So address. does that mean you're going to have to go through all the listings all there's, the time? There's a process for it, but yeah. But well, there is this is random that audit seems to 10%. me additional cost, additional staff time, additional. So, so that in the first needs. staff report, I, we broke down the hours and the, right. the relative oh, okay. workload impacts. Um, it doesn't take long for Milwaukee's market. 10% of Milwaukee's market at the peak is 12 homes. Uh, 12 homes split between two weeks. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes max yeah. if there's a whole compliance process. Um, it gets pretty streamlined and it doesn't take long at all. So that would be for like houses like all of ours that currently exist and whatever, but what about like the new developments that are going in and so the developers selling the homes, how did, so I don't know new, how those get listed. New development okay. has, there's a specific home energy score assessment for new development. They get a scorecard that looks similar except it's a one-sided one, one -sided scorecard. It yeah. just doesn't have the recommended improvements on the back of it just because, I mean, the, it's a new construction. Um, but it has the utility cost, it has the carbon cost, it has all that information on the front of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, they would still need to be compliant if they're publicly right. advertising that home for sale. Yeah. And so the compliance structure as is has that 90 days with the $500 fee following. And I see that we are running out of time. Um, but so there is some flexibility with those 90 days as well as the fee structure. And that's um, what we were seeking guidance on was do you, would you recommend or would you be interested in shortening or extending that compliance uh, window and then as well as the fee structure? I think the fee should, I mean, why is it more than, I mean, is that like triple the, the cost of an actual assessment? So the thing is 90 days to comply, the amount of assessors that are in the market right now, you can get a home energy score same day. Right, and it doesn't take long. They're not in the home for long, so they have 90 days to comply. Which a lot of times, 90 days is actually over the right. amount of the house time a house will sit on the market. Right. Sure. So it's yeah. pretty generous. Yeah, there was just an Oregonian article, and I met I meant to try and look it up, but I saw it about two weeks ago that was listing like the 15 mark, you know, parts of town where the homes are selling the fastest, and Milwaukee was number 14, and. Uh, I think they said average days on market was like 22 yeah. or 19, yeah. Yeah. something in there. We haven't had a um, So yeah, days a lot of them are going to be yes. long, long and ago so sold. That's why um, Portland in the future is interested in shortening that window. Um, and then the way that the $500 fee works is that's $500 after a notice of violation. So the notice of violation arrives in the mailbox, you have 90 days to fix it. Um, if I caught it in compliance or Tim, we'd be the ones checking up on it. We would, of course, preclude that with a lot of outreach and education. Of course, let people have the opportunity to change first. Um, they get a $500 fee, and then actually the way the code is written, there's 180 days following that before they get another $500 fee. So that's, you know, a but quite a already, broad amount of time. They can sell the house three times. And they're not living here anymore because they sold their house. And that's the difficulty when it comes <laughs> well, to the agent hasn't really gone anywhere, though. That's why it's good to have a real estate though. agent pay it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's they're another here. reason for the doing agents. The $500 fee, though, with the exception, I think, of our plastic bag ban penalty matches all, oh, of, our, yeah. right? all of our other That's our standard. So talking, that's the standard Talking with penalty. Tim... You know, and, and Tim is all about simplicity and efficiency because he's just the best code compliance coordinator ever. Um, if we were to follow a similar style to Milwaukee's code enforcement, it would be $500 a day following that notice of violation. It would be $500 a day? A day. So that is more typical of how our fine structure works. So this is actually a variation to provide a larger grace period, yeah. knowing that the home sale process is complicated. Um, sometimes wires get mixed and mail gets thrown away. And so um, that, that we're especially working with the industry stakeholders as well as community stakeholders, that's how that 90 days was established. Portland is just now seeing a decrease in compliance because a lot of people are now familiar that 90 days is, you know, long enough to sell a home. 
And so um, they ha are seeing a decrease in compliance. They are. Oh, and interesting. So, okay. And so they well, so are ramping, but but they have not been finding anyone right. yet. So so now they're implementing fines, and they're hoping to get up back up to eighty percent compliance. So I just want to walk through what happens. You've got a house that's. You know, it's been on the market for 20 days. It's pending in Milwaukee. You go through the listings and you see, wait a second, this doesn't have a home energy score. I have a flow chart for that. Yes. <laughs> it was also yeah. included on your first staff report, too, if mm -hmm. you want to pull it yeah, up. Yeah, I remember that one. So how it would work is, your, for me, on a process side, um, the home is advertised for sale. Um, and then I would check the random weekly or bi-weekly or monthly sample of listings. I'd create a random number genera generator to figure out right. number six home and number 10 home is the one I'm checking. I'd go through public listings. I'd find those homes. So that way it's fair and equitable. I would check to see if it has a home energy score. If it does, awesome. I close the case in my personal database. If it doesn't, I can send a written notice of warning to the realtor, but then I inform Tim in code compliance that crosses into his territory to submit a notice of violation. That notice of violation enters into the home seller or realtor's hand. They have 90 days to remedy. Within those 90 days, or even after those 90 days, whenever Tim's process works, uh, we check to see if the compliance issue is resolved. If it is, fantastic. He closes it in his database and he informs me and I wrap it all up with a bow. If it's not comp uh, the compliance issue is not resolved, then they get uh, a fine imposed after that 90-day grace period. And then essentially we go back into a loop. Have they complied? Have they not? And that's how it goes until they do comply. And then he closes it, and then I close it. Mm -hmm. And that's the process for keeping it um, managed and evaluated. And so the compliance, if they, if they have closed I'm just trying to come up with the worst yeah, case what, scenario yeah, here. Yeah. so they closed they've moved out of the house they still didn't comply how do you get them into compliance do you they know? have to navigate that with the the new homeowner to get in there to do the home energy score? so that's a challenge is we only have the only available information is the realtor's email and the pub the address right? right the homeowner name is not on there right and we don't know where they've moved off to i can pull up that information from the tax assessor for when they currently lived in that house to get names but mm -hmm. that's about it yeah. yeah tim says he will find them <laughs> i i don't know his process for that um, okay but yeah, that is a like challenge that, that portland has been seeing is is once somebody moves how do you how, how do you get that information um and that's just a, yeah, a challenge. Not too good so I guess history. it would be it would be another step for staff, but I kind of I kind of like to see like maybe an intermediate, like a thirty day notice, and if you do it if you don't do it in thirty days, you maybe have a hundred dollar fine. Mm. Yeah. But because and then maybe the ninety days and the bigger fine or something because I mean I'd like to try and incentivize getting it done but mm -hmm. when it still has some right. meaning right. at ninety days in the vast majority of cases it's going to have no meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can get compliance in the thirty days by doing that, then you may actually save some staff time because you don't have the second whatever right. whatever it is that Tim does. <laughs> I'm still not sure. I don't know if I'm frightened or very interested. Right. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we can explore doing either a um, an outreach, a measured outreach and engagement opportunity to make sure we contact them with information about it at 30 days, at least. Because sometimes I think a lot of times the homeowner isn't aware this program exists, or right. they're not the realtor is not the one well, informing yeah. them about it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if anything, it would uh, discourage realtors or in encourage them to be more knowledgeable of the program right. and making sure that they're providing right. best services. And that's the other reason. I mean, that's one of the other reasons Again, why if they had to, to pay it, they'd be a lot more yeah. Yeah. Everything we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, it does certainly improve compliance. It will yeah. absolutely yeah. improve compliance. Yeah. So um, just because I know that we are now 10 minutes over, um, I just want to say thank you. And we'll look at exploring those options that you guys are, are interested in. And hopefully we will be able to modify the program and bring it to you back in September um, to see what other either feedback you would have or if you're interested in adopting the program. Until then, um, I will try to continue to research to see and pester Justin to see what his opinion on some of these uh, subjects are. Um, yeah.
Are there any other questions that you guys have? I, w I do want to get just another question for, for Justin is the idea that I think that we need to define, you know, clearly make sure, you know, what a listing is. Um, because, you know, I, I, I actually a very good, well, two good examples. One, a very long time ago, I put a, a make me move price on Zillow when I was first exploring Zillow and looking to see what it meant. My house has never been for sale. So if I get a notice, I mean, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, to what Elvis is talking about here. Um, you know, also, I almost bought a house once because someone had a sign. I was really, I, I, it was really interesting. They had like a, a you know, a for sale sign and a phone number in the window, and it like literally didn't say anything else about it. But, but, and no one That's, had called them, and they told me when I called, and I, I called the number, and I said, are you selling your house, or what was that? Um, and they said, yeah, we're selling our house. You're the first person who's ever called in a year. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I mean, we have to make sure that we're actually defining what a listing is. I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't think yep. that having a sale sign in the yard that doesn't actually clearly define what is for sale. They could have been selling a car for so all. So the I thing know. with the, <laughs> yeah. the public facing signs is that even on staff so on, on my side, there's no way I know that house is for sale because I'm not driving around Milwaukee right. looking for signs. Right. right. So, um, but on a Zillow Make Me Move, you have a button. It's either right. listed for sale or not. The, the hard move part is, is not a, a listed for sale. There's are two different things yeah. here. I think the hard part about that, and we definitely would want to explore it, is that is that a, a definable sales situation or is that a software specific service specific like is that only mm -hmm. zillow or is there is red well, if it's, doing if it it's on mls i mean if it's on the rmls you know listing it's listed for sale if it's got a number it's listed for yeah. sale. right if it's you know i mean i think we can come up with a definition that, that yeah. is broad enough to capture those things but also not so broad that we're capturing people who are not selling their homes so yeah. when somebody Sell, sells their home themselves. Do they still get an um, I don't a listing number? I mean, I if they're if they're they paid, I don't, have to, they paid I don't know that they necessarily because do. That would be there's a way to get. We can come up with a. Yeah, yeah. I think and, and it's not. Yeah. There's that's that'll be part of the code. We're not going to catch everyone. Right. No, it's just not, no. right. But I also don't want to. I don't want to drag net either. Sure. Well, no. sure. there's I also the way that the way that the, spend any time the, way that the code are not selling their homes. Right. The way that the code is written <laughs> offers a lot of wiggle room for discretion on the staff side, right? If right. if we reach out to somebody with a notice of violation and they call me in a panic, there is so much like ability yeah. for us to coach and educate and provide outreach without resorting to a fine. Like I yeah. said, 90 days in the home sale process is a pretty broad window. So even if we yeah. accidentally caught somebody who was like, oh, I'm not actually selling my house. I just, you know, have a for sale sign that I threw in my front yard accidentally. Right? <laughs> you know? I well, think how did that get there? But I really don't even think I had to prove ownership when I did that. I literally was just like on Zillow one day and I was like, make a yeah. move. Sure. Well, well, and I think that there. there's going to be a lot of people Nobody asked around. me if I, no, I didn't have to yeah, provide they didn't verify any, that, verify that, that I owned the person. Right. <laughs> so and then if you got, put any if you got something oh, in your mail. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that to you today. Right? <laughs> Maybe a quick call to a staff member. I mean, that's, that's the fortunate part is we'd have a direct line to me or yeah, Tim yeah, and yeah. we'd be on the same page. Mm -hmm. And the code yeah. is written in a way that provides flexibility in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also clear definition. And same yeah. with the, the situations of exemption and financial yeah. distress. Yeah. There's a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Well. It's hard work, good work. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you. I am opening doors into the mortgage industry. I'm opening my own business. <laughs> it's comes funny, out. my husband actually works for the mortgage industry, and so I've been calling him at work being like, all right, you have to define this for me. <laughs> Which is great. Good resource. Um, but yeah, so I, I also shared this on the slide deck. This is, I just quickly made a, a flow chart for the process, right? So if we're mm -hmm. gonna have somebody go through the process, this is like the questions that they'd have to ask themselves to yeah. get a home energy score. I really want to stress that it's very simple to get a home energy score if you're going to be participating mm -hmm. in it. Layla had a meeting with us and she did it. She was like, oh yeah, I forgot I had to do that. And she pressed a button and she had one scheduled for that day. Yeah. It's pretty simple and it's a simple sheet of paper. We just want to make sure we get the program framework right so it works yeah. for the community. Yeah. And so I thank Sounds you guys. Can for you your send opinions. us that slide? Yes, it will be available on the slide deck that we're going to be sharing, but okay. I can also send you okay. guys a copy of the PDF. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks you. So much. Sorry for keeping everyone over. All right. Well, I think that that's it. So, all right. All right. We are adjourned. All right. Thank you Thanks. very much.